So hi, my name is uh, Jeremy. I'm a senior software architect at DocBox. And I'm going to talk to you guys today about our medical IoT platform. I'm going to show a picture of it real quick. But uh, so we'll talk about the company a little bit. I'm going to talk about the platform, go into the technical details of the hardware and the software. We're going to talk about a clinical application that we have built on top of that platform. And then we're going to talk about the uh, patient bedside HMI as a whole. So, DocBox, uh, healthcare technology company based out of Boston. Uh, the cute folks moved in next door a couple months ago. Glad to have them. Uh, we're creating a medical IT platform to do a whole bunch of things. Uh, but the most interesting of those, enabling data-driven hospitals. So this platform, it's not uh, medical IoT like, like my Apple Watch measuring my heart rate or whatever. Uh, this is meant to be used in hospitals, meant to be used in ICU, intensive care unit. Uh, it's actually out in, it's in production right now. It's at a hospital in India. And some of these photos are actually going to be of the product deployed on site. So here's a more a closer picture. Uh, on the right, that's Steve, our director of biomedical engineering training, some nurses on the clinical application I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, on the left, just to give you a concrete picture of the, the thing we're talking about, it's that touch screen right there. It's, uh, there's no keyboard, there's no mouse. It's not a desktop computer, it's not an EHR, it's an uh, entire HMI uh, built up from the ground up to support an application platform. Uh, on the right, on that same picture, some cables that are connecting uh, some medical devices. A, uh, I think there's a multi-monitor and a ventilator in the background that are plugged in. <coughs> so, uh, the DocBox Medical Internet of Things platform, it's a commercial implementation of a standard called the Integrated Clinical Environment. It's published as ASTM F2761. The key idea to understand about it is it defines a, a future in which medical devices are interoperable. Uh, medical devices uh, that are built by different vendors. Uh, today, we actually have uh, those, those medical devices that were plugged in, in the last slide. Uh, they were not built from the ground up to support the integrated clinical environment, but we have driver support for existing legacy medical devices in the hospital today. But certainly in the future, uh, we anticipate medical devices being built compliant to that standard such that they can natively talk. Uh, and not only medical devices, but we want to support applications. Uh, I'll talk about system and clinical applications later on. But these uh, applications and these medical devices are all going to speak uh, a same, a common language, and they're all going to communicate over something uh, called a data bus. Uh, think of it as a having access to a shared database of data in real time. So uh, the software stack of the uh, patient bedside unit. Uh, at the base, right now, we're using the Ubuntu Server Edition 1604. Of course, we're using the Qt application framework to uh, not only create the system UI, but also to create all the individual applications that are going to run on it. Uh, this next one may be a little unfamiliar, uh, RTI DDS. Uh, DDS is our communication framework uh, for communicating between devices and applications. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, and then we have, for lack of a better name, uh, what am I going to call it? Integrated Clinical Environment SDK, which is just our helper libraries and code that uh, defines the that, that common language that's spoken over DDS. So for folks who attended the Qt automation talk yesterday, uh, DDS actually got mentioned in that alongside MQTT and several others. Uh, it's, not, it's not used in uh, consumer technology, so it's not as well known. Its uh, background is primarily in industrial military applications, much more robust. It's very uh, heavyweight compared to something like MQTT. Uh, they would characterize uh, the data distribution stand, uh, standard as uh, data-centric publish-subscribe, uh, which uh, the data-centric part, it's sort of the way you interact with it. Uh, it it's not, it's a, as opposed to message-centric, like something like Dbus, it's access to this uh, real-time pool of data uh, that everyone has, you can have the same view to. Publish-subscribe is to differentiate it from uh, some point-to-point -point communication. Uh, a, a participant can publish out any data, 
and anyone who's interested in receiving that data can subscribe to a topic. Uh, data distribution service is an open standard defined by the object management group. Uh, we chose to use the RTI's commercial implementation. There are several commercial implementations as well as one open source one called OpenDDS. But you could have uh, a process or a piece of software using RTI's implementation and it would happily talk with uh, another piece of software using the open source implementation or one from a different vendor. So having established our technical foundation, uh, this is an example of a clinical app that we've created and is currently being used at that hospital in India. Uh, to explain what a flow sheet is, uh, so this product is being used in the intensive care unit. So uh, you're in some kind of an a tragic accident and uh, you're really hurt bad. You put it in the operating room, but you survived. Everything is great. You get wheeled out to the intensive care unit and hooked up to all manner of medical devices. Uh, now, once an hour, it's a responsibility of uh, a nurse to go around and document the state of the patient. They'll have this very large piece of paper that folds over on itself twice. Uh, and they will go to each of the individual medical devices and log the patient's vitals in, in a big table. So we saw an opportunity there uh, to uh, assist the nurse in the, the job of documenting the state of the patient. So these applications, they're built with QQuick. Uh, we have some custom controls and the heavily customized uh, style and palette cho color choices. Uh, and we take data from the integrated clinical environment uh, using RTI's C++ uh, APIs. We take the data off the data bus, all these medical devices publishing different metrics, and the application can just pull off of that and we write custom item models that then expose it up to QQuick. So the nurse is going through documenting the state of the patient, but a lot of these fil fields are automatically filled in because the medical device is already doing the work of seeing how the patient is doing. So uh, we've taken Qt and we've used a whole bunch of different modules all over the place uh, to, to make this application. In some cases, we've even extended existing uh, modules. So the landing page for that previous application I showed you, the clinical application. Uh, again, this is another photo of, uh, from the hospital. The, the landing page has two data visualizations for the benefit of the nurse. Uh, so they can, when they come to the patient at a glance, see uh, what's the current state of the patient, what's the state of the patient over the past 18 or so hours. This landing page, uh, the upper half comprises an events visualization that we'll talk about in a moment. On the bottom, all those little squiggly lines, uh, we use cute charts to display an 18-hour history of uh, the state of the patient. Now, uh, the nurse can go through and configure uh, wh whatever set of uh, measurements they want, but just for the... So up here, there's uh, six measurements overlaid on the same graph. Uh, we represent them as line series. Uh, we take in a very large amount of data from these medical devices. Uh, the current set of drivers that we have that we've built for existing medical devices at the, uh, the hospital we're deployed at, they're uh, publishing out one sample a second. Uh, over the course of 18 hours, that's 64,000 samples. And then you multiply it by the six you're showing on screen at the same time, it's a lot of data. Uh, fortunately, uh, within, fairly recently, within the past year or so, they added an OpenGL backend to Qt Charts. Uh, the Qt charts, the default implementation when it was using the raster method, choked pretty quickly uh, when she hit like 10,000 points or so. Uh, but why do we want to show so many points on screen? Well, uh, it's not a static view. The, the user can go and navigate on the timeline. By default, it shows the most recent three hours of patient vitals. But you can pinch and zoom out and see the whole uh, most recent 18-hour history of how the patient's doing. Um, and then as you zoom out and zoom in, you can also swipe back and forth. You can zoom in to an order of, of several minutes. So at that point, the individual samples become discernible on the screen. Now, just for context again. So uh, that this landing page for this clinical application, the upper half, events visualization. So what sort of events are we showing? Well, uh, we track clinical system events. We track uh, events like an, what we call an operator, but it's a nurse coming in and authenticating themselves on the system and logging in. So we'll display on a, again, an 18-hour history, uh, who, which 
nurses have logged into the system, have logged out, what medical devices have been connected and disconnected from the device, uh, the name of the patient that's med uh, admitted, uh, you know, when has the clinical flow sheet application documentation most recently been submitted. And we show all these naturally on a scatter plot, just show a little dot on a point in time where this happened. But uh, dots alone don't really convey a lot of information. We wanted to have uh, some tiny piece of text, at least to help differentiate uh, these individual points on screen. So out of the box, QCharts doesn't support that. So we dove in and created a custom series. It renders a little bit of text uh, adjacent to the XY coordinate. So operator login has the text operator login. But again, we would like to have more information. We'd like to, uh, so in the, in the case of the operator login, the user who's on the, the system can touch that point on the events visualization and bring up this little call out and display some additional details. So uh, user presses that operator login. Oh, okay, log uh, operator H logged in, and they logged in on uh, June twenty eighth at little afternoon. Uh, okay, great. Well, we've introduced another problem. That is because much like the trends, patient trends component, you can zoom in and out. So what happens when you zoom out such that these points, uh, the ones that are vertically uh, at the same you know y coordinate, start merging together and it becomes difficult to read? Well. Uh, the way we've resolved that, we do a little thing called point merging, and we'll just figure out at what point would the text and the point start overlapping, and we'll just represent them as a single point on the screen. We'll do that work in the, the abstract item model subclass. And then the call out then, so there's like two dots there, so the user can swipe through back and forth and look at the, uh, the I'm not sure why multiple patients would be admitted to this, but they can look, look at the two different IDs that happen at roughly that point in time. Uh, fun thing, the date time axis on this chart is synchronized to the patient trends chart down below. Uh, so when the user is navigating around, pinching out, zooming at different levels, or navigating back and forth on the timeline, you can make a, a vertical correlation between some event that happened at a certain point in time in the state of the patient. Uh, maybe a certain nurse that they don't like entered in the room and their vitals spike. Yeah. Now, uh, the majority of the time and work that's going to be spent in this clinical application is going to be a uh, nurse documenting how the patient is doing. So for that, uh, as uh, the photo from earlier showed, there's no, there's no keyboard, no mouse, right? So this is all touch interaction. So we want an on-screen keyboard. We evaluated a couple choices, but the cute virtual keyboard was far and away the best choice for this. But still wasn't enough. We, we wanted to make a few extra changes to really make it our own. So instead of bringing up an on-screen keyboard, obscuring, say, the bottom third of the screen, and then having the, the cursor in this tiny little input box, uh, we, when a user enters in uh, an input field, It'll bring up and present the uh, whole keyboard full screen. And we'll represent the input field they're editing in the upper half of the screen, displaying the text that they're entering in a nice, big, readable font. We'll represent the, the question or the name of the field. It's up a little bit higher. Uh, obviously, we've stylized this uh, pretty significantly compared to the version it ships out of the box. Layouts are also interesting for us. Uh, now, there is some support for different layouts. Actually, what I'm about to say, most of this actually applies to Qt 5.8. Qt 5.9, they fixed a couple of these issues. Uh, in Qt 5.8, the, the options for layouts are mostly limited to uh, different languages. So if uh, you have a, English is your preferred language, it'll bring up the e English alphanumeric keyboard. And within that, you can then choose slightly different layouts for digits uh, for entering in someone's phone number or just entering in text. Uh, we wanted to present buttons that were clinically appropriate for the field that was being edited in. So we extended the keyboard functionality a bit. And uh, beyond just supporting you know, the one or two custom layouts, uh, we have uh, completely uh, the ability to define completely dynamic layouts for each application or even individual fields presenting uh, different buttons that are appropriate for the input. So this is. Uh, shows uh, units that are appropriate for the fields that are present on that particular flow sheet and will register the, the units as distinct output, though at the end, this does all become one screen. But 
presenting the, the UX in this manner encourages correct data entry. So the whole point of developing this application at all uh, was we suspected that with our platform and uh, the application that we were creating, that we'd be able to reduce the amount of time that nurse was spending documenting. Uh, so we've done some preliminary analysis, and we compared at our pilot deployment site the, the steps and the process and how long it take to, took to complete that manual process to completing the reports digitally. Now, uh, it's important to note that at the end of the day, the application does eventually produce a printed paper report because for uh, legal reasons, the, that paper record uh, constitutes the legal record of care for that patient. Uh, going through that entire process, either filling out that giant piece of paper that gets folded over multiple times or the one that gets printed out at the end of the day, uh, we found a reduction in the amount of time spent documented by 75%. And that was primarily due to the medical device is publishing the data to the data bus, the application then sucking in that data and automatically filling in all those fields for the nurses. So they only had to fill out a handful of additional fields. So stepping back a bit, it, we're not just developing a single application, we're developing an entire platform for applications. Uh, to support that, we're making use of the Qt Application Manager, which uh, if you've attended any of the cute for automotive talks you possibly recognize. So for the, uh, for the automotive world, they wanted to be able to create HMIs that you could load up different apps, uh, load up a contacts list, uh, your messaging app, music, whatever else. Uh, and there was some very nice overlap between the regulatory concerns and just uh, concerns for the safety of the user that they had when developing the Qt Application Manager in the automotive suite that made it uh, a fairly natural uh, use for us. Uh, now, we're bringing this up on Ubuntu. We have an uh, Intel Core processor, so we're using the integrated graphics for hardware. The system UI that we've developed, which is the, the Qt Quick UI that the Qt Application Manager loads up, for us, it has two major responsibilities. It does you know, the window management of multiple applications open at the same time, switching between them, and navigating between them as enabled by this navigation column on the left. But also, uh, possibly a unique use case. I, I suspect the folks in the automotive world don't encounter this, but if there are no authenticated users in the patient's room at that point in time, there's no nurses, we don't want to allow free access to the system. So uh, we bring up a lock screen, much like you get have on your desktop when you hit a little shortcut because you don't want anyone messing around with your icons. Uh, and the nurse will have to re-authenticate themselves. They have these little um, badges, much like this, so they have a little barcode scanner and will zap themselves in and authenticate that. They are the person and they're supposed to be there at that point in time. So this image here shows a little exploded view of the big guy here is the system UI. Uh, so it's not really a lot going on there. It's really just the navigation column and uh, a background. All of, our, all of our applications, though this does have an opaque background, the applications are actually uh, translucent. So you get this nice little uh, visual effect that I don't think comes across in this slide, but it's there. So the applications will take up that big chunk in the center. And then we have a little menu, not menu, uh, a little bar up top that gives a summary of the, cur of the current patient admitted into the system. Now, from Qt Application Manager's perspective, these are native apps. Uh, it can load up uh, QML applications, but we're, we're creating and compiling C++ executables because we make extensive use of those DDS libraries that requires a lot of C++ code to pull data in structures and package them in such a way that the item models can then you know, blast them out on screen to the cute quick UIs. Uh, I mentioned earlier there are two different types of applications. We have system apps, which provide a, a standard core that gets shipped with every single one of these units. Uh, system apps provide things like uh, the ability to admit a patient and discharge them, to add, you know, authenticate users on the system, to connect and disconnect medical devices, um, and change settings and whatever else. But clinical apps is where it gets really exciting because uh, we envision the, the, these dock boxes having completely different configurations, uh, probably per wing, d depending on where they're used and what their use case is, they'll have entirely different clinical apps installed on them. Uh, and that's partially because maybe you don't need one app 
on certain parts of the hospital. But these clinical apps are from a regulatory perspective, and this is from the perspective of um, the FDA, who we're, we're, we're actively working with to get this uh, platform certified. These uh, clinical applications are effectively medical devices from a regulatory perspective. So nurses will need to have training on individual, uh, you know, individual applications and... Uh, yeah, so that that will differ between the different wings and uh, different patient bedsides. So something interesting we ran across, and rightfully so, the Qt Application Manager uses Dbus for inter-process communication. Uh, so that I'm trying to think of how we uh, examples of where we use that. Maybe in an application, there will be a, a button that launches another application, so that'll communicate back to the Application Manager, and that'll affect some change on the system. But we're already using DDS, which is uh, you know our our inner process inner process communication solution, and there's really not really a need for us to use Dbus other than that just happens to be the tool that communicates between the application manager and the applications right now. At some point in the future, a uh, fun project to undertake might be figuring out ways to integrate DDS into the Qt application manager such that we don't. Do you think so? You know so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, making use of DDS so we just have one single inter process communication solution between all our software. So, to wrap that up, uh, our vision of a medical internet of things, uh, it's not, uh, you know, well, watches, it's like it's those big, expensive, really safety critical medical devices installed at hospitals, and not just you know future ones, but ones today. We're, we're already supporting a whole bunch of different medical devices uh, speaking uh, the ICE language. And what this medical internet of things enables is a data driven hospital. You move from the periodic, infrequent documentation or data that comes from just writing data down uh, on, a, on a big piece of paper or document in the EHR, and you have access to this wealth of real-time data. Uh, and you, so all this has been done with an incredibly small team, like single digits engineers. Uh, the first couple of years of this, uh, of this company were mostly spent researching sort of the, the foundations of how feasible the idea was from a, from a domain-specific perspective. And it's only been the last couple of years that we've actually gone into production, started writing the software, getting the hardware working, testing everything. And uh, it's thanks to not only incredibly long hours on our behalf, but uh, also the tools provided by Qt that have enabled us to do all of this stuff. So I didn't even get to go to what happens when you have that huge wealth of data because that would have just exploded the scope of this out to a three-hour talk. Uh, but definitely check out the uh, Twitter account. It has a lot of nice links and videos about the work we've been doing with uh, Intel and Cloudera to do stuff once you have all that data in the hospital. Uh, thank you for your time. Does anyone have questions? Also, feel free to come up to me afterwards if you don't want to ask questions from everyone. Yep. Because you say you use currently existing devices which aren't exactly like Wi Fi enabled. Right. Uh, how do you connect to it? Oh, let's see how fast I can go back. There we go. Uh, so, uh, medical devices that have an electronic interface is frequently um, RS232. Sometimes it's, this guy might actually be Ethernet. Uh, so this guy is our effort to help integrate legacy devices that don't have, uh, that don't speak ICE natively. Uh, so we'll plug them in and we'll communicate over whatever their protocol is and translate that into the language of the integrated clinical environment. Even the proxy for devices that are already somehow electronically enabled? Right. Right. Right, if there's no electronic interface, then... Uh, we can't really do too much about that quite yet. But uh, we're hopeful that we can get folks really excited about this and start getting them to develop uh, devices that speak all of this natively and don't even need that, that little box right there. I saw someone in the, in the back. Yep. Uh, just uh, to understand the context of the visual chart, right? These different signals. So what kind of signals are, are these? I mean, I... Uh, these guys? Yeah, these are, um, flow's a little blurry. Uh, 
Most of my screenshots I got to take off my computer so they're nice full resolution. This was a shot from way out. But uh, if I had to guess, frequently it's like SpO2, uh, pulse rate, um, blood pressure, stuff like that. Okay. Yep. That single measurement over a period of time is plotting out dots that even might look like that. Yes. So each of these lines, uh, not only is it a single measurement, each of these lines represents uh, a single measurement over time from a single device. So you can actually, uh, if you have maybe one device that you trust its measurement of a certain metric more than another, you can just swap it out. Yep. Uh, for now, uh, let's see if I can get back to the photo. So the, the situation today is that because this is a new thing, because there aren't medical devices built to this standard. Right now, yeah, all the medical devices need to plug into one of these ports, and we need furthermore to have written a driver to take whatever the, the communication, whatever they spit out over the electronic interface and turn it into our language. We envision in the future um, the, this box and even this human-machine interface here is more accidental than essential, which is to say that the, the critical thing is that there is the data model and the standard, and you're able to just have different nodes that take different pieces of responsibility on it. So the HMI could be split up between, uh, you know, maybe there are a bunch of smaller screens, maybe there's something crazy like uh, a mobile device that you know, automatically picks up the data bus as you come in and you communicate through it that way. But uh, it's... It's nice and easy to explain to uh, nurses when you have this uh, very specific piece of hardware that you can put in front of them and they can use. Anyone else? No? All right, well, thank you all for your time.